I'm tired of people telling me that Linux is too hard to switch to. Sure, I get it. The terminal looks scary, but with more modern distros, you don't have to know that it even exists anymore. And it's all thanks to beginner-friendly Linux distros, especially this one that looks just like Microsoft Windows 10. Now that Windows 10 has reached its end of life, droves of people have been flocking to this specific distro by the masses, so much that it's hit over a million downloads. So this is the supposedly magnificent Zorin OS. Now I've heard crazy claims about this thing. YouTube comments saying they've been using Zorin for years with no issues. So is it truly the perfect Windows replacement or are there hidden troubleshooting quests along the way? And most importantly, can I install this on my parents' computer and not have them call me every single day for tech help? I don't know. And to find out, Let's download this thing. Ah, uh, yes. When you search up Zorin, you get this. Zorin OS. Make your computer better. Now that's a compelling tagline. I don't remember Mint or Fedora selling me on them. I gotta admit, the Zorin's website is clean. There's not a billion options like with other distros. Talking to you, Ubuntu. Whoever designed this website deserves a raise. You're welcome, whoever you are. They have a grand total of three options. It's got screen grabs of a Mac-like UI, a Windows UI, and something in between. Is that Windows 11 or GNOME? So Zorin talks a big game. It's lightning fast and designed so you don't have to learn anything to get started. A bold claim that one. I'll be the test of that though. So when you click download, there's three options. A pro version that costs a one-time fee of almost $48, a free core version for basic use, and an education version for schools and students. Now that's pretty cool. But are there really any school districts currently using Zorin? I searched around for about 20 minutes, but I didn't find any hits. That would have been very cool otherwise though. So core it is. Linux is usually free anyways, and I don't see why I would need to pay for appearance skins and open source software that I could install at anytime, also for free. So if anything, the pro version seems a bit bloated for my needs. But for other creative professionals, I can see why having some software options at the ready can save them time and they won't have to do any research. Surprisingly, the download button just jumps into a download right away. There's no information here about making sure that your ISO file is good and not some bad actor file. Zorin thought ahead and has a automatic check when you boot from the thumb drive. So if your file is corrupt, you'll know it before you install. Pretty smart. But let's say that you do end up with a corrupted ISO file. Zorin doesn't make you type any weird commands into your Windows or Mac terminal. Instead, they created this app called Quick Hash. That'll check the sum for you. Ha <laughs> nice. And despite how simple and straightforward everything's been so far, I still can't imagine my parents ever being able to do this. I definitely have to install it, test it, and then hand it over after it's checked all the boxes. Now with my handy dandy thumb drive and toe, I put it into my USB-A slot and button mashed F12 like crazy. Some of you won't need a guide to do this, but if you do need one, it's right there on the download page. They've thought of everything. And it's a pretty good guide too. It's got clear step-by-step -step instructions. It even tells you to try it live, which is very important. I wish they highlighted that in red or another obnoxiously bright color, because if you install a full distro only to realize that something crucial like Wi-Fi doesn't work after the fact, it really sucks. Fortunately, Zorin looked great and try it live. Wi-Fi and Bluetooth worked. And after that, I just jumped into the install. And a few minutes later, I was met with a classy startup menu. Ooh, look at that logo go from text to logo. Stunning. It's fresh. It's sleek. But is it going to walk the walk? They promised big things after all. So now that it's installed, here's the grand plan. Number one, use it as my main laptop for at least a week. Two, solve problems without using the terminal and big long troubleshooting sessions along the way. Three, determine if someone techie but Windows bound like my husband Jake can use. And four, determine if my parents who are not techie at all can use it too. So they're currently using an ultra old Office PC right now. It's got Windows 10, 12 gigs of RAM, a fourth gen i5 CPU, and all my dad uses it for is checking email and watching videos. And of course, to show you along the way, I've got to install OBS, which was a simple one-click install in the software app. It did give me a billion options from Flatback to Zorn to Snap. I picked Zorn because it seemed like the smart thing to do. I'm using Zorn, so maybe this was a Zorn optimized OBS seems logical enough, right? And if you're interested in diving deeper into what Linux can really do, there is an unlimited amount of power in the terminal. Once you get the hang of it, you can do anything that you're doing with your mouse via the command line and the terminal. So if you're interested in leveling up, check out boot.dev, the sponsor of today's video. They have a ton of courses on languages like Python and Go, or even more specific things like learning Linux. Although we all know you don't just learn Linux, no. 
You become Linux. The UI looks like an old school text-based RPG. You have the lesson on the left, and when you answer questions correctly, you get XP. And it's not just with text, they also have engaging videos to help explain complex ideas too. The lessons have personality, like this image here. <laughs> By the end of the first chapter, I had learned things that I didn't even know before. Despite my last six months of dabbling with Linux, <laughs> maybe I'm the one that needs to sit down and learn Linux. So if you want to have more Linux experience than I do, go to boot.dev and use my code to get 25% off your entire first year on the annual plan. There's a quick start guide that launches that shows you how to do all the basics like launch apps. It's exactly like in Windows where the bottom most left start menu and apps pop up. There's a bunch of preloaded apps too, but most of these are just normal things like file browser, text editor, calculator. So far so good. It looks like there's next to zero bloat. You even get a LibreOffice stack for office work. Nice. Then it jumps into an appearance editor with four layouts to pick from. The top two resemble Windows, then a Mac one, and then one that looks like GNOME. I picked Windows 10 and moved on, but there was even more appearance stuff. Whew. There's dark mode, light mode, accent colors. Oh man, tough choices. But it's cool that there's options. Lots of options from 3D cubes all the way to jelly wiggles. You can do what you want to. It's your computer after all. There's even a way to combine your laptop with your phone, like how Apple does it. Unfortunately, it's only for Android users. Lame. I mean, good for you, Android people. Also, isn't this just like KDE Connect, but it's called Zorin Connect instead? The world may never know. Unfortunately, I, as an iPhone user, um, cannot test this feature fully, or at least that's what I thought. After doing a little bit of research, Zorin Connect is just a reskinned KDE Connect, which means I can use it with my iPhone. But the process involved a lot of troubleshooting, so I decided to move on disappointingly. Finally, it was time to install software. Now that I'm in the software manager, it's time to install all the daily use software that I use. You've got Discord, Audacity, Notion, Local Sand, Retro. Arch, and even Steam. <laughs> Just kidding, I only work at work, okay? No gaming here, but I might test that later. The biggest problem was Notion, which you could use as a web app, which is nice, but to unlock its full functionality, it's recommended you install the program. Unfortunately, it's only available on Windows and Mac and not Linux. But I did see that you could install .exe files by installing this thing called Windows App Support, which when I looked, it was nowhere to be seen. But I do have something called Wine and Bottles instead, which I've used before. Those add a layer of compatibility to Windows apps so they can run on Linux, but it's not 100% guaranteed. So I tried it and nothing happened, like always. I really can never get Notion to work on Linux. So I guess I'm running Notion as a web app again. Now the bright side is most apps you use nowadays can be web apps, stuff like YouTube Music, Spotify, and Google Docs. So not having the program while inconvenient isn't a game changer. Now there are softwares that just won't work on a Linux computer like Adobe Premiere and Photoshop. So if you happen to absolutely need those for work or for a hobby, Zorn might not be an option. Luckily, most people aren't so trapped within their software ecosystems that they could find something else. Because if you're looking for video editing software, there's open source versions like Kden Live. You've got LibreOffice to replace the entire Microsoft suite like Excel and Word, and you can replace Photoshop with something called GIMP. So if you're willing to go look, Linux usually has its own replacement for software. So as the day went by, stuff that's usually a hit or miss on Linux went by like a breeze. My XM6 headphones connected no problem, and even printing was so easy. It automatically locked onto our printer located on the same network. It's pretty nice. Now there was one thing that bugged me constantly. For some reason, my date at the bottom right was not in English. So I went into the settings to change up the language and surprise, it happened to be in Spanish. No big deal. I changed it right back and moved along. Now, what I did find was a Vietnamese option in a language support app that I saw. And I figured why not play around with it in case my parents ever do want to do that. Turns out it didn't work. <laughs> Later, I realized that it did, just not on the common system menu. So far, I'm impressed. There's nothing out of the ordinary, it's functioning really well, and it just works. But I think I spoke too soon because when I came back to the laptop the next day, OBS decided to not open. Hmm. Now I've encountered this in the past, so I just installed it again in another version, flat pack this time instead of the Zorin version. And I was back up. Now as the week went by, little problems popped out here and there. I have this little one terabyte SanDisk portable SSD that's password protected, but the app to 
enter your password doesn't work in Linux. The suggested suggestions I found were to dual boot from Windows, unlock it, then boot back into Linux. Well, I sure wasn't going to do that. <laughs> so I used an alternative solution to backing up my footage, just sending it to my laptop uh, via this thing called local send and then moving that footage to the SSD through my Mac. Now, is that the most roundabout way to doing this? Probably but I need it to be done. It's a work thing. Now, this specifically isn't just a Zorin problem. It's a problem of Linux in general, or maybe it's not even a Linux problem because Sandis is the one who chose not to make a Linux workable app. Now, regardless of who's to blame, the issue still exists and small issues like this exist everywhere. And another one, when docked, you can't close your laptop screen or else it just suspends. A small yet annoying thing, but why doesn't that option exist? And I looked and it does. You just have to go into your terminal and change your config files to ignore closing your laptop lid. Great. This one is on Zorin. I've seen this option in other distros. So many people use their laptops and they dock it and it makes sense to have this option in the settings menu. For my own sake though, I tried out the terminal command and uh, I can see how scary this can be. Even for someone tech savvy like my husband, this stuff isn't as much scary and intimidating as it is annoying. And here lies the problem with some Linux distros in general, even for ones as streamlined as Zorin. Most people can use a terminal. They can look up solutions and they can follow along. They can solve all of their Linux related problems. But when the thing they're used to just working doesn't work, even if there's bloat or frustrating sometimes, the unknowns of Linux and the prospect of things not working might be too much to ask. This is the year of Linux though, so it is becoming more accessible, especially with the use of ChatGPT for troubleshooting. And yes, I know, you have to know what you're doing to filter through a lot of the responses because they might be wrong but it's still empowering to know that there's help somewhere. When I first got into Linux, I browsed solutions on Reddit, Stack Overflow, only for all the YouTube comments to tell me to just use AI. So yeah, AI can be wrong sometimes, so it helps to verify what it is you're typing before committing. But compared to before where Linux was just a deep, dark rabbit hole, AI is helping people switch to Linux. So I think that's a win. In Zorin's case though, their forums are extremely helpful when you encounter a problem, even though it can be a lot of work. So it's only those rare ultra niche use cases like my SanDisk SSD that I really start to have problems with using Zorin as my only operating system. But there is something that Zorin does pretty well. Actually, most Linux dishers do this really well now, and that's gaming. Valve has worked really hard to get games compatible with Linux. It has Steam right there in the software store. You install your games, you download them, and you start playing. Now, not every game works, but Valve is making a lot of headway on this front, so we'll have more gaming in the future. But I'm on a work laptop, so I don't play many intense games anyways. Stardew Valley works great, so to track Mania. Most of the time, Steam handles compatibility through Proton in the background, so you just click play like normal. No troubleshooting needed. It's awesome. So is Zorin the perfect Windows replacement? It has most of it. It's got a clean, simple UI that people can just jump into. They can use what feels familiar to them. Many of its decisions make intuitive sense. The bottom right taskbar icons for volume, battery, Wi-Fi, even the quick start guide was actually helpful. But when things take small turns here and there, it gets tougher. For people that have the time and the desire to really make Linux work, Zorin is a great first step. It's even easier than Mint and Fedora, in my experience. If not for the little laptop problem I have, I would have never had to go into the terminal to do anything. For people who want to install Zorin on their parents' computers, well, you'll probably want to test everything and make sure it's working before handing it off to them. Otherwise, expect a lot of calls and screen shares. And people who just want this thing to just work, you'll most likely be fine, especially if you use your machine for really basic stuff like email, browsing the web, YouTube, watching videos like this one, gaming, talking to your friends, family and friends through Discord. It does a lot really well. But no OS is absolutely 100% foolproof. They all have their kinks here and there. And sometimes with Windows, you've got to go in and edit your registry. And with Mac, you've got to learn the UI and the keyboard shortcuts. So if you're looking for a perfect distro, it doesn't exist, which can be sad, but also really exciting. It means you can stop looking and just commit to learning one really well. It will become the perfect distro because you'll just get it. You'll customize it to what you like and you can troubleshoot it like the back of your hand. Of course, there's not much troubleshooting to be done there. Check out boot.dev in the link below and thanks for sponsoring today's video. If you're interested in learning more about Linux, watch this video right here. Bye.